Yeah. Holler yeah. Creek School of Appalachian Ecology is a small private school serving children in kindergarten to fifth grade. It's located in Carroll County, Virginia, just below the Blue Ridge Parkway. Its two founders are Aaron Siebens and Melanie Shragi, both experienced educators who wanted to create a school that embraces what they call radical rural education. They launched Holler Creek in the fall of 2021. Aaron and Melanie, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This is a fun opportunity for us to take a break in one of our work days and talk to you about what we do. Yeah, we're excited to share what's going on down here. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what's going on. And I really want to dig into this amazing term of radical rural education. So we'll get to that. But first, I'd love to hear a little bit about your backgrounds, how you both got interested in education. You both uh, had careers in more conventional classrooms. So maybe we can start a little bit with that pathway to education to begin with. Aaron, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. So um, I think both of us, our families were heavily involved in education growing up. Um, but I was uh, in the education program at the College of William and Mary um, as a history major. And so I did my student teaching in history. And then after college, I taught in Japan for a year with the JET program. So I taught English as a second language in the middle schools in very rural Japan, uh, about as rural as where we are now. And then uh, when I came back to the United States, I taught with with Melanie at um, a private school on the North Shore of Boston that specializes in teaching students with language-based learning disabilities. And so um, we both have a background in special education from working with high schoolers with language-based learning disabilities. Uh, and then we <laughs> took kind of a we wanted to do like a year of service. So we um, volunteered at a school in rural Honduras in the mountains of Honduras. And I taught fourth grade there and I'd never taught elementary school before. So that was a big change. But then we came back to the United States and I ended up teaching fourth grade for the next 12 years in Durham, North Carolina in an urban setting. And, you know, that Felt like, like you said, that was pretty much felt like a full career in 15 years. Um, And once the pandemic hit, you know, a lot of things changed. Um, I'm sure Melanie will talk about this as well. But when, you know, I was in a very student centered school where, you know, teachers given a lot of freedom to teach um, the curriculum the way they thought best, which, you know, made teaching feel like more of an art form than, you know, a lot of institutionalized education is. But um, once learning went online and it was Zoom school, it was just like the pits, you know, it was like the the hardest part of my teaching career, a huge transition for teachers and learners. You know, it went from showing up to school and every day, every day, everyone being like, oh yeah, you know, this may not be a perfect day, but I'm glad we're here together, you know, making progress, working together to showing up on Zoom and everybody being like, I don't want to be here. None of us want to be here. Um, And so, you know, as that time went on and we're like, Melanie and I were both like, gosh, this is just no fun. You know, it's, it's, we, we, so when we came up with the, the idea of starting a school, we're like, we want to be as far away from Zoom school as we can be to, to be the opposite of that. And, you know, here we are three years in, and I think I think that would be one way to describe what we're doing. We're, you know, mm-hmm. outdoors all day, every day, um, connecting to the world around us rather than just being in front of a screen looking at boxes. So, you know. Oh, I love that. It Melanie, that what part, would, oh, yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to add, Melanie, what would you, what would you add to sort of your origin story of getting into education and and then moving to becoming a founder? So I, a lot of my story overlaps with Aaron's, um, as you'll see, I'll just kind of move quickly through those parts, but um, I did not study education in undergrad, um, but when I, I studied linguistics, actually, I'm, I'm really interested in languages. And once I graduated, um, I 
moved up to the North Shore of Boston to work at the school that Aaron mentioned. Um, working with high schoolers, I was a live-in faculty. It was a residential school. So it really felt like I got my start um, as an educator in an alternative setting. It, it felt pretty alternative. Um, it was a private school, but the classes were four kids to six kids. Maybe I had a class of eight kids at once. Um, I had tutorials with all the kids there got tutorials that were one on one. So I really loved seeing the progress that I could make and the relationship that I could build with students in a really small setting. Um, so I, I got my master's in special ed. We went to Honduras and I taught third grade there at that school. Um, in Durham, I actually got another master's in speech language pathology. So I worked with that in the school settings and an early education too um, for 10 years, I guess, after I got my, my degree. Um, and it, again, I did it mostly because I liked the alternative option of working with small groups. Um, that just, I love working with all ages, but the small groups is like a really key part of, of what makes it rewarding for me. Um, so, I also went virtual um, a little bit before the pandemic, actually, because I did it partly so that I could be home with our kids some of the time. Um, we have two children. But when the pandemic hit, they were virtual, too. So I was doing the mom working virtually and trying to supervise my kids virtual education at the same time. And it was a huge mess. and. Um, it was nice to be with our family, but the the career part of it during that time was really hard. And so when we started spending time up here in the mountains in Cain, Virginia, in Carroll County, um, we spent time during the pandemic there. And just this idea just started to kind of pull at us that we wanted to be here. We wanted to be in person. We wanted to create something in this place that was really, really speaking to us. Um, we saw an opportunity and we just really wanted to, to make it happen. So neither of us was, was too um, settled or pleased with what we were doing virtually. That, that seems to work well for a lot of people, but the way it was set up and the way we were doing it was not going to be sustainable. So we came up and, and did something new. Oh, just amazing. And was it something that you ever thought about? I mean, did you think that you would become school founders or was it really because of the pandemic disruption? I don't think we would have without the pandemic. Yeah. It just, we had kind of loosely talked about it before, but more honestly in the context of, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> I don't think I'd be up for that. <laughs> um, but when we just thought of it as being a small group of kids and in this place and including our own kids in it. Um, and during the pandemic, everyone was just kind of starting to be a little more open to, mm -hmm. to alternative options um, and think about school differently in different ways it could be done. So I think that all just came together for us. And we had the time to do it if we were both. Were, you know, yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. We had more bandwidth to be able to pour energy into the ideas and making stuff. So, yeah. But it still must have been a leap for you, right? I mean, you left your jobs to become entrepreneurs. That must have been felt a little bit scary. What was that like? It it was. I mean, like, you know, like we it took a year's worth of work before we opened our doors to to make the school happen. And doing that while we're teaching online and doing virtual learning with, you know, our kids was a lot, you know, it was too, mm -hmm. it was very split brain. I still need to do this, but you know, it wasn't like we had a year off to make, to make it happen. We had to do it on top of everything else we were doing. So it was, and you know, one great thing about the field of education, I think is the connections that you make over, over time. And so we called in, lots of favors, asked lots of people for help. Um, and our board of directors um, are just really the ones, the people who started, helped us start the school are really supportive and 
creative people who gave us lots of good suggestions, mm -hmm. lots of good information, um, pushed us when we needed to be pushed. Um, I think it also just helped us feel like we had support and that we weren't crazy, that we wanted to do this. Um, they were all people that we really felt like we could lean on and get advice from and just bounce ideas off of too. And um, even though, it, you know, at the end of the day, we're the ones who like do all the, we do all the doing, but just having those people to back us up and offer some kind of moral support um, was really reassuring and helped us do it. <laughs> So what were some of those startup steps or entrepreneur challenges that you took or encountered in that year leading up to the fall 2021 launch? Yeah, there were a lot of steps. And that was the first, the first step was figuring out all the steps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I, we, we got our board together early on, I think October, um, about three years ago now. And we just called up all the people that were kind of our dream board members. <laughs> and we started meeting with them. Um, we undertook all the 501c3 mm -hmm. status paperwork. And um, that was that was challenging. Yeah. That was a lot of steps to get the nonprofit status. Um, we also had to get charitable status um, in the state of Virginia. So, I mean, there's just a lot of set up things. I guess we had to register as an LLC first. Yeah. They were, it wasn't easy. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of marketing, mm -hmm. you know, web, created a website, build our website, make a video, a mm -hmm. promotion video, um, create application, you know, and all, just kind of get all the, the stuff behind what we're doing, all the reason for our pedagogy and our curriculum, um, yeah. place-based education. And then I'm sure every micro school has its own story about um, their space, oh, yeah. but we had, I mean, countless hours of work and we could never have done it without Aaron's family. Um, so our school is, we mentioned that it's rural. Um, it's on land that Aaron's family lived on when he was growing up. So he kind of moved back home to make this yeah. happen, mm -hmm. um, which has its own different things, yeah. but um, we, the building that we used we, first, we thought, oh, let's have it in our house. That'll be great. We could use the whole basement and it opens up into the grassy yard area. And I'm so glad we didn't do yeah, that. <laughs> that would have been too much, but we do have a building that was an old tractor shed that's been on this land for, I don't know, Almost as long, as, long years, as people yeah. have lived on this land. Um, and so we used this old tractor shed and we made it into a school. So before we made it into a school, it was Aaron's dad's workshop where he built instruments. He was a luthier. Um, so he's the one who really helped us to like gut the whole thing to get, he had to sell off all of his woodworking stuff. We had to clean it all. We had to rip out all the walls. We painted the floor, we put up new walls. Um, I mean, it was just a ton of work. We, we add the bathroom. Yeah, never the first been time plumbing in here before. <laughs> this building in a hundred years has had a bathroom with toilets. Yeah. So, like, getting the physical space prepared was kind of the last step. Mm -hmm. It felt like, and we were doing that up until almost the day school started mm -hmm. um, in August. So the last couple months was a big push to just like get this space ready. Because um, even though there were only nine children enrolled at that point it was still like you can't just have nine children in a tent I mean you have to have something and we wanted to bring this vision of this space to reality too and we kind of read tried to do research about you know outdoor place-based education and looked at schools in Maine and seen what they had you know done with the elements in Maine and the challenges they had and you know We've run into, you know, like you think like, oh, an outdoor school, you have to think about water and rain. That that's going to disrupt learning a lot. Surprisingly, the rain isn't that big of an issue. But when you have wind and you're outside and papers blow around everywhere, um, makes learning a lot harder. So we have we have all kinds of paperweights. We have wind screens. Um, yeah. But it's just been interesting. The things you think you would have that would be a problem 
aren't and um yeah there's a new developmental milestone for me that i yeah. didn't realize was something but keeping an arm on a paper so it doesn't blow away <laughs> doesn't happen till a kid is like eight or nine somewhere in there so all of our younger kids the papers just blow and they have to chase them and uh, but yeah, he said that the rain wasn't a big deal for us. We have several like covered outdoor areas. And one thing that makes our school unique is um, our school campus is about a quarter of a mile from where kids get dropped off in the morning and get picked up in the afternoon. So it, we meet out at our creek. So there's a creek where there's a parking lot. And then every day starts and ends by walking into our campus and walking back out mm -hmm. to the creek. And, you know, like we've, you know, been in school three or 400 days now and only one day has it been raining too hard for the kids to walk out yeah. at the end of the day. So, yeah, yeah. It, when, when you're outside all the time, it, you know, paying attention to, to the weather, it's just, you know, second become, yeah, it feels like we are living outside and, and we are learning outside all day. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how your educational philosophy came to be. Uh, you talk about outdoor place-based education. Tell us a little bit more about what that means and how you sort of came to that approach. Well, none of the other places that we'd worked up till here were mostly, at, well, Honduras was kind of mostly outdoors, I guess. Besides that, I think it was pretty much indoor based, um, pretty, pretty standard, creative, but pretty standard building and philosophy. Um, so, but here, I guess we, we knew we wanted the biggest part of this whole thing to be that we we're going to be located here in Cana, Virginia, on this land. Um, this, this place is kind of what was what was cementing it all together. So we kind of thought, well, why not learn from that, from the place? And it's something we really believe could happen in any place um, because everybody who goes to a school is part of that place. There's not really too much else that unites people that go to school. Um, you know, everyone has different religion, different backgrounds, different all kinds of things, right, that make them diverse. But everybody lives in that place, whether they grew up there and they've been there forever, or they've only just moved there a month ago, that's where they are. Um, and we believe that if you can learn from the place that you're in, it's really grounding and connecting you to the moment too, and to the people around you, the community that you live in. So that if you move away and you start learning at a different school, then the hope is, that children will be able to take that learning style and apply it to a new place to wherever they are. Um, that it's really important just as humans living in this time that we connect to where we are and what's going on around us um, rather than, you know, lean into the disconnection that seems like it's so prevalent now. Yeah, and you know, another, with the pandemic that, you know, the feeling of disconnect that everyone had, you know, again, we're trying to get as far away from that. And, you know, we, yeah, we, our, one of our taglines is, you know, if you teach a, if a kid can pay attention to the world around them, then they'll be able to learn wherever they are. Um, and, you know, in our, in our teaching careers, we've both seen that, you know, giving kids common experience and being outside, you know, all kids' memories of school are when they're not in their classroom. Kids don't yeah. remember sitting in a desk and filling out a worksheet. That's not what, you know, kids recall from, from their school experience. So if, if you're providing, and we, we, you know, we feel like we have the data to back it up with, with test scores, with, you know, personal anecdotes from parents, you know, that when, when you give kids experience rather than just information that it, you know, they not only do they remember the experience, but they actually remember more information as well. Um, and, you know, I've seen teaching in a, you know, urban public school, I, I saw the same thing. We, you know, we did probably about 10 field trip um, experiences a year. And that's always what my, my students would come back and, and talk about. It elevates kids writing. It elevates their ability to communicate with each other because 
again, the common experience, being able to, to talk about this thing you share, this place or this experience really knits a community together, we feel like. Mm. Yeah. And you're really integrating this outdoor place-based education with core academics. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're focused on both and you're in this rural community. So you're sort of this radical rural education motto fits. Um, You're still quite small. I think you said your enrollment's about 11 students, um, low cost, and it's sort of pay as you can to make this as Mm -hmm. financially accessible as possible for families in your area. Uh, You also welcome in homeschoolers for sort of uh, one-off day programs. Um, But tell us about what education is like in your rural area and what do you mean by radical rural education? Well, we mentioned um, before we started recording that in, I think in most rural areas, but specifically here, the only education that exists is the, the traditional public school. And we're a you know not just rural but low population density. So in our county, you know it's a pretty large county and there's thirty thousand people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know when I w- went to school here, I had to ride the bus an hour and a half each way to go to middle and high school because there's only one high school and one middle school in the entire county. And so I spent you know spent three hours a day on the bus. Um, and so that. Rural areas also face a huge uh, funding difference from urban areas and suburban areas. And so schools have less resources, uh, teachers get paid less. um, So the school systems here face a big challenge to provide, you know, these spread out areas with, you know, quality quality services, quality teachers. It's hard to attract, um, you know, the the teachers and the resources that are needed to provide like the education that the kids need, I think. And so we we feel like the educational system here um, faces a lot of challenges. And, um, but we think that rural areas can offer a lot of things and have a lot of gifts that urban areas don't. Um, if you go around a lot of rural areas in Appalachia, you'll see a lot of vacant land vacant houses and our school is created on on a place where there was vacant land and a vacant house you know this is an old apple orchard that um you know nobody was living on and there's an empty building and we're like well there's pretty low startup cost you know besides rehabbing the building um and if you think about rural areas now virginia isn't a voucher state and so if if it were possible for school systems to be able to you know, populate micro schools, you know, that's how, how schools used to be here. In Carroll County, in, um, in the 1920s, even, you know, there were 101 schools. <laughs> now, yeah. there, now there are seven. And, you know, the population then was probably, I would guess, one-tenth what it is now. But ev- there were schools every mile or two, somebody would have um, 10, 5, 10, 12 students, um, in their house or in a in a side building. This is this is actually how education used to work in rural areas. And to us, that would be the really radical thing if as part of, you know, whether it was part of the public school system or voucher funded, that um, entrepreneurs would be able to kind of give jolts or revitalize, mm-hmm. you know, education in rural areas with I mean, we have, you know, we have a hundred acres on our campus. We have waterfalls, we have caves, we have two creeks. Um, we have apple trees. We have huge gardens. I mean, these are things you can't do in urban areas. You know, there's so many students who don't have access to that. We have that here, mm-hmm. but so many, so many rural areas have those kind of gifts. But the schools, you know, there's I have a whole side thing about school campuses and school building design. But a lot of school campuses you go to, there aren't even trees. They cut down all the trees because it's less maintenance. They don't have to break up the leaves. So you go to a school campus, there's a brick or, you know, concrete building with no trees. And so it, it's for students to be able to learn outside is a huge challenge because um, for teachers, there's no incentive to, if you just go outside into a parking lot to, to teach a lesson to your students outside. 
So it's really a, this sort of radical rural education is really a blueprint for um, micro schools or sort of these one the, the modern one room schoolhouse mm -hmm. yeah. resurgence yeah. Um, exactly. that you're talking about of this sort of hyper local place based education using the gifts of your rural communities. Uh, yeah. It's just exciting to yeah. see. Yeah, and again, getting into the small groups, I think. I mean, the first job that both of us had in, well, second for you, job in education we both had was teaching in groups of eight or fewer. And here our classes are eight or fewer. It's just it's not that eight is the magic number, but small group setting is just really, really just heads above yeah. a large group setting for, especially for younger kids. Yeah, individual attention. We were talking today for elementary school age kids is no no benefit of being in a group of 25 or 30 children. All Not it needs really. is less, less personalized learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in middle school and high school, that's that's a little different. But, um, yeah, we feel like you can get rid of any other radical thing, but if you have small class sizes, um, it makes a huge difference for students and for teachers. So what do you see in your rural community or kind of the broader geographic area where you are? Do you see more interest in what you are doing? Do you see potential momentum for kind of creating this decentralized uh, education, hyper-local ecosystem? Yeah, in some ways. So we've, we, we feel a lot of community support, um, especially from like a handful of people that are really our cheerleaders. Um, some of them are on our board now. Some of them are just our neighbors. Um, we have wonderful neighbors that are really supportive of what we're doing. Um, the Facebook community seems mm -hmm. overjoyed with what we're doing. Um, we had our first graduating class last year and I mean, they've still been in touch and brought us some supplies we needed and, um, things are going really well. Again, where we live though, there's, there's 30,000 people in the whole County. So there's just not a ton of people. So I feel like, um, even though everyone's like, oh, I, I wish I could have gone there when I was a kid or like, Oh, this sounds so great. I think the challenges are just people opening to an alternative. I mean, you have to like, it's one thing to be supportive and love the idea of, a my, I guess I'll call us a micro school for this purpose of a micro school um, outside of the public school system. But it's another thing to actually want to send your child there mm. and feel like, I mean, it really does feel outside of, of the norm and our families that, that come to us, um, you know, if they're part of like a, a church organization or something, they'll, I, I know they get tons of questions from other people they're connected to about our school. They're curious. It sounds just so foreign to do something like this for your kid in and, a place where this is the first alternative option that there's really been. And to drive your child 25, 35 minutes. I mean, we have yeah. one, one family who comes from an hour away each day, you know, each way. Wow. Yeah. And so... Right. Again, in a rural, that's, you know, a challenge of a rural area, you know, um, is things are far away. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's a long way to go for in terms of like replicating it. Um, I haven't, we've gotten maybe one or two phone calls over the years from people who've been interested in doing something like this. Um, nothing's too much has come of it, but I, th I think the other thing, just besides the overall buy-in of people and and being able to provide their kids with transportation and resources and whatnot, um, I think the other challenge is staffing and just finding people who want to live here, who want to do something like this. Um, we don't get paid very much at it's all. A ton of work. Yeah. It is a ton of work. It's like a whole lifestyle choice. So it, it's not just a job. So um, that's something some that's appealing to some people, but it's uh, not for everyone. <laughs> and, Were you going to um, add something, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. this kind of answers a little different part of the question too. That 
we've noticed in our student body that the people who are more interested in our school are seem more of the homeschool mindset, that it's a bigger, it's, it seems like what we've learned in, in our operation is it seems less of a jump for people who have homeschooled in the past mm -hmm. to for their child to come here than for people who've been in the traditional school system to come here. We had, I mean, it's a mix of both, but it seems like culturally um, being, you know, the school in, and that's another big thing about rural areas is, and the two things that are in rural areas that kind of knit communities together are churches and schools. And so if you're not part of the, the school in the community, then, you know, you're, you're kind of saying you're not as bought into to that whole group. And that brings a lot with it. That's really interesting. So you are a recognized private school. You're not a homeschool resource center the way some micro schools are mm -hmm. uh, established, yet you do welcome homeschoolers in for one-off programming. And I think that's interesting that you already have homeschooling families or these sort of early adopters, people who mm -hmm. already bought into alternative education models as some of your, your biggest cheerleaders or those who gravitate to your program. And so it sounds like you're saying the challenges around recruitment or scalability of radical rural education would be that kind of population buy-in, uh, um, openness to alternatives to a conventional mm -hmm. system, transportation and proximity being challenges, staffing yeah. being challenges. Mm -hmm. And what about sort of financial accessibility? Do you see that as a concern as well? Yeah. Uh, you know, like we, our area is, is, is relative pretty low income. And so for, you know, the idea of paying anything for school um, in, in general is, is very radical. And so, you know, our tuition is $5,000 a year, which for, um, you know, the education we offer, we consider that to be very low, but for this area that is astronomical, you know, that's in almost infinity when people- Yeah, it's in infinitely more than you pay for public yeah. school education, so. So that's, you know, that's, but we are, um, two thirds of our, our students are majority scholarship students. And so we do a lot of fundraising to, to provide scholarships and you know, we've we've applied for lots of grants, have not been very successful with grant funding, but we've had a lot of private donors who supported um, education for other people's children, which we think is, is a really big deal. You know, to me, that's the most powerful and important thing in education is not just caring about what happens for your child, the outcome for your child, but caring about outcomes for other people's children. And so, you know, we feel, you know, like lucky and blessed that people have have bought into this idea and will support learning for other people's children. Yeah. And Aaron, you mentioned vouchers, uh, many states now passing universal mm -hmm. education savings account programs that allow lots of flexibility in terms of how families use funding um, could be for micro schools like yours or homeschool resource centers or tutoring facilities or educational therapies or uh, traditional private school tuition. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in many states, these ESAs are, you know, seven or $8,000 a year per student, which is quite a bit more than you're even charging, which would yeah. be probably a game changer, I would imagine. It would, yeah, it would be, it would reduce <laughs> our workload and, and, increase accessibility infinitely if people yeah it would it would really change the ball game so interestingly i was referred to you and to holler creek from a parent of uh, some students that attend your program and she said that uh, sending her kids there has been life changing those were her words what do you hear from parents who enroll their kids at holler creek what do they find to be so transformative Oh, well, we have, I mean, we serve 12 individual kids. Well, last year was 12. This year it's 11 individual kids. And I mean, they, they really all grow in their own ways. But um, I mean, for example, we, we just started our kindergarten this year and we've been going four weeks to kindergarten. And we've already heard from parents that they, they see changes in their child. They seem more comfortable. They eat more because they're outside playing. Um, so I, I mean, they work better together in a group than they ever did. And, and those are things that could happen in any kindergarten, but, um, I don't know. I, I do like to think that a lot of it is, is how we're doing things. 
And we had our first graduating class last year. And so they'd been with us for, for two years, each of them. And there were, there were huge, there was huge growth. Um, yeah. I can't say too much about the individual kids. I mean, we're, we're such a school of individuals, but um, uh, some of them came to us because their public school w wasn't working for them or whatever situation they were in was, was not working. They weren't happy. They, they had, some, some issues with it and they just didn't have any of that at our school. Um, they had, they were friends with our group. When you have such a small group, um, most people get along pretty well or they learn how to get along pretty well. Even if they're not best friends with everyone at school, they have, they have strategies for, for being with those people all day. <laughs> um, I just think that kids, they really grow as creative thinkers at our school, um, they see things around them, they ask more questions, they are more curious. Um, what would you add to that list? Um, you know, I would add that I think they gain a lot of confidence and um, being in a small group, you know, they, I think they see the growth. Kind of one of our big philosophies is, you know, for kids to, to learn the things that are hard for them And the things that they're good at, and to what, that's that's what builds self confidence. It's really powerful for for an individual to be able to feel like I can do this, I can get better, I can grow. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in a smaller group, you feel like you matter more. You know, when you're one of one of twelve in a in a school group, you you matter a lot, and that feeling of belonging and mattering. Um, and other people can appreciate and see your growth too. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's not it, it's not like it's utopia. It's not like, you know, everything's perfect all the time, but, you know, being able to solve conflict in a smaller group is, it, is easier being able to, you know, um, have different roles. One really interesting thing for that we've noticed is the multi-age education, how, how big a deal that is for kids to be able to have the role as, as an older student to nurture a younger student to, to play, you know, like for a fifth grader to play these crazy imaginative creative games with first graders that they wouldn't get to do normally. Um, you know, that, that made kids kind of grow and stretch like, oh, I can also be this to have like different, different roles and different selves that they can, can have at school. Um, we often say it's that they're almost, it's almost like a cousins group mm -hmm. when they get together because it's, uh, yeah, I mean they're different ages. The the old like Aaron said, the older ones can kind of model things, but also get down and play with with the younger kids and have somebody to look up to them. And the younger kids have these role models, um, and older kids that mm -hmm. show them different ways of doing things and help them play different games at recess that they wouldn't play. And we have you know fifth graders working on the same project as a second grader and as teachers. That's challenging for us to create meaningful work and projects that will engage them and have access points for different age learners. But for a second grader to see what a fifth grader is doing and be like, oh yeah, I can do that in my work. You know, it really lifts. And that, that also makes the fifth graders want to do better work. You know, we talk a lot, you know, through place-based education and project-based learning about quality work and what that looks like at different ages and different levels. Um, I also think, I mean, this is, I don't, think it sounds trivial, but, you know, we, I think our, the students become much more physically confident. You know, we hike 150 miles a year. Um, and so they, it's, that was one of the a really powerful thing to see, like the difference in the way the kids move and climb rocks and walk on trails. You know, if, when you log 150 miles in a year, um, become better at, at moving around. <laughs> Oh, I love everything about Holler Creek and what you've built. I hope that uh, there's many more of these programs that sprout, especially in rural America. And maybe for our last question, you could share some advice for education entrepreneurs and specifically education entrepreneurs who are looking to launch micro schools or personalized learning models in rural communities. What advice would you have for them? Ooh, 
you know, well, go ahead. Well, uh, again, I, I think this is what all schools should do, whether micro school or giant high school, but they capitalize on the, the resources of your area. That's what place-based education, you know, is all about. And going back, that's what one room schools were like. That's how humans first learned to eat and cook. They learned what they had around them and they used it. So where we live uh, is a big orchard area and our neighbor has an orchard. So we go and glean apples after they've picked all the apple trees and use them as part of our, our fall curriculum. Um, so I think my biggest advice would be look for people in your area who are, who care about where they are, who love where they live and care about that region and, and the gifts of that, that place. Um, Cause every, every area has that and every rural area has different gifts. And so find the people who, who are passionate about where they live and connect with them to help you get ideas for what to make your school work around. And I would add that since everybody who's hypothetically listening to her advice would be thinking about starting a micro school, you don't need to have thousands of people who love the idea. You only need 10 families or however much you're looking for. Um, the rest will, will just come from that. So not that you have to think have a huge advertising budget we can get a, a couple more kids a year and, and that's really all we need so um i would say you know stretch your ideas and your creative mindset and be ready to work really hard but don't don't feel like you need to convince every person that what you're doing is is worthwhile you only need a handful of people um and also just something that came from us Learn, doing this, something I learned was just that like you have to be fully committed. Mm -hmm. So you have to fully commit to an idea. And when you when you make that, when you arrive at that place that it becomes clear that's what you want to do, everything else will fall into place. You will figure it out, you will do it step by step, and it'll it'll all work. But you have to really commit to it and be sure about what you what you want. Yeah. I was gonna add a little bit about that, that yeah, people are drawn passion and so if you have this if you can hone this idea that you're passionate about you know people are going to say that won't work you should do it this way or that you know like maybe you should do this you know hold to your passion um and, and have that confidence in your idea because that that will make other things happen and fall into place Ah, oh, such great advice. I hope uh, listeners and viewers take that advice to heart and hopefully fill rural communities everywhere with magical spaces like yours. <laughs> if my listeners yeah. and viewers want to connect with you, learn more about Holler Creek, what is the best way for them to reach you? Well, our website is hollercreek.org. Um, it's H-O-L-L-E-R Creek. Um, there's a lot of confusion around that. <laughs> it's, it's kind of part of a local dialect, I guess, just meaning like a place within the mountains is a holler. So it's not like holler back. It's like mountain holler. Yeah. Um, our contact info is on there. So we'd be happy to hear from you. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram, Holler Creek School. Yeah. I think that's the best way Wonderful. Well, best wishes on the future of Holler Creek and Aaron Stevens and Melanie Shragi. Thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thanks so much, Thanks Carrie. So much. It was great talking with you.